Um, so my name is Philip. I'll be your guide for this session uh, called Budgeting Basics. Um, so appreciate everyone being here. I think a few more people will probably join us, but you're here on time. So let's go ahead and at least uh, get started and they can join us. So Clark from Get Set Up is on with me. If we have any uh, technical questions, uh, just get with Clark in the chat and he'll work with work with you to, uh, or work with me as the case may be to get our, our, our technical issues uh, fixed up. And I am um, basically I live in Chicago um, and have done a lot of budgeting just for my on my own. I've kept my own personal budget for almost 40 years, did some budgeting at work, uh, treasure at High Rise Condo Association. So those are some of my practical experiences regarding budget. And today I join you from Florida. I'm visiting my mom. So a little, little, little warmer than, than usual uh, today for me at this time of year. So thanks again for joining us. So what I'd like to do is, excuse me, just go over the basics or the objectives of what we're gonna cover today. Then I'm gonna turn it over to any of you that wanna ask a few questions about uh, Anything in particular you want to make sure we cover, or if you just want to say a few words about yourself, maybe where you're from, any of those things would be great. Um, so our plans today are to talk about what a budget is and how it adds value, um, the information needed to create a budget, and then we're going to explore different types of budgets and the strengths of each. And when I say different types of budgets, all budgets really do the same thing at the end of the day, uh, but they approach it from different angles. Um, so we're just going to look at different budgets that, that really approach things from different angles. And then we're going to talk about some online budgeting tools that will help us budget. So that's the plan for our session today. So with that, if any of you want to say a few words about uh, yourself and anything in particular you want to make sure we cover, that would be great. Or if you want to just put a few words in chat, whatever you're more comfortable with, um, that would or any of those things work. So anyone want to say a few words? I'm in Miami, Florida, so you're right, it's warm down here. <laughs> yep, I'm, I'm uh, in West Palm Beach, so just about 50 or 60 miles north of you. Well, I'm in New York City. And it was a beautiful day yesterday, but today it's a little bit cooler. So I want to be where you are. <laughs> well, my, my wife uh, texted me a picture outside our window today, and it, it snowed overnight a little bit. So uh, she's going to fly down here and join me in a couple of days. So, but we'll be back up there soon enough. So um, thanks. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. So, um, you know, if anyone's created a budget before and worked with one for a while, please feel free to uh, share any tips as we go. Uh, and in general, I like these, these sessions to be interactive. Please ask questions. Uh, if you want to put them in chat, that's fine. For this session, probably easier just to unmute yourself and ask the question as we go. Don't save them to the end. Um, I'll make sure to, to have some gaps of, in time where we can ask some questions, but please. Uh, some of the concepts here are, are a little more difficult to explain. So if I'm not doing a good job of making it clear, uh, let me know and we'll we'll try another angle to see to make sure we're all on the same page as we go through the concepts of budgeting. So really, what is a budget? And, and a budget is managing your spending uh, is really what it comes down to. And a lot of people think of that is a straight jacket or something difficult to do or a penalty, I can't spend money on such and such. So I would like to sort of reverse, hopefully reverse the mindset of a budget. Uh, and the budget, if you do it correctly, since it, uh, you follow where you're spending your money, it allows you to spend less on areas that you don't enjoy as much. And then that allows you to spend more on things you like and enjoy. Um, so if we think of a budget as helping us um, being able to funnel more money into the things we like, the things we enjoy, uh, it puts a whole different perspective on it. So 
as I alluded to earlier, I've been budgeting for a long time and I, you know, I like to go out for uh, dinners or go to a jazz concert in Chicago, things like that. So if I can, every time that I find an area where I can spend less money that I don't really enjoy, I just shuffle it over into my, my entertainment budget, which I enjoy. Now, some of us need to, I understand, try to spend less money overall, and that's fine too. So if you need to do that, you want to take it away from the things you least enjoy. Uh, or at least that's my perspective. And if you think of it that way, the budgeting tool is something to help us and not a straitjacket or a hindrance um, that really makes the whole situation a lot more fun. Um, and then for a budget to be successful, you have to understand your own money personality. So this is something that our money personalities, usually most of our personalities regarding money have probably been around for a long time. We probably gained some of them from our parents. Um, and we've changed some, most of us, but we still, our money personality is our money personality. And at this stage, we're not gonna change it much. So when I'm talking about money personality, it's how we interact with money. Some of us are, by default, we're, we're savers or uh, we, we, we get some money, we wanna save some of it. Um, others are spenders. Uh, we get a little extra money and we just like to spend it right away on something uh, pleasurable for us. You know, other people are investors they are really trying to invest their money. You know, others may be true debtors where they don't really care about how much they're spending. And if they need to go into debt to do it, it doesn't really bother them as much. So we're not here to discuss everybody's money personality. You can keep that to yourself. That's, that's not the, the, the challenge here. But I want you to be honest with yourself as to how you deal and how you interact with money because your money personality, if you aren't honest with yourself as to how you interact with money, you are not in the long run gonna be successful um, in regards to being able to maintain a budget, just being honest and candid about it. Um, so a couple other people have joined us. We're just, just getting started. So my name is Philip. I'll be your, I'm your guide for this session. Uh, and we're just now talking about the the basics of what a budget is. Um, and also for those that were here the whole time, I, I talked about earlier, we're gonna talk about a few different budgets towards the end. And a lot of these budgets deal, different budgets deal with different money personalities. So you're gonna be able to figure out which budget maybe goes best with your personality as we go through the class. And again, if you're honest with yourself, this will be uh, something that you can do. So any questions so far? All right, so to create a budget, let's talk about the principles first, the thought processes behind the budget. The first one is you have to set realistic goals. So what I mean by that, let's just say as an example, right now you're spending $500, about $500 a month on groceries, and you're going to put together a budget. You can't just put in the number 300 for groceries and, and be realistic, right? Because you can't just, by putting the number down, you can't, you can't stop spending 40% of what you were spending before just by writing a goal of $300. It's not going to work. You're still going to spend $500. However, if let's say you're spending $500 now and you put a budget of 450 and you come up with some game plans, you're, you're going to shop mostly on the day of the week where your grocery store uh, has discounts or has senior discounts if, you're, if you fall into that age group. Or maybe you're going to start using electronic coupons um, or maybe you're going to buy more uh, labels from the store brand versus name brand. Now you have some goals, some realistic goals. You, you've changed what you're doing and being able to reasonably lower your budget from $500 in this example to 450 is something that's reasonable uh, because you've set something that's obtainable and you put some reasons in on how you're gonna do it. But you just can't put in some number 
without some thought process behind it. So that's, a, I think, a good example of realistic goals. The other one, if you live with somebody else, you really need to budget together. And by that, I mean, you have to understand what the budget's about and how you're going to relate to it. Now, there's lots of different money personalities. We talked about that before. And usually if we do have a, a spouse or a partner or a companion that we're living with and we need to budget together, more than likely that person's personality and the way they interact with money is gonna be different than the way you do. So this can be a little bit of a challenge and uh, to be candid with you, that's the challenge that, that my wife and I have. We, we think of how we spend our money in different ways. So I've worked through those over the years and, and tried many different ways to help to make sure that we budget together and are comfortable. So if anybody, we could have a, probably a whole session on just that, but if anybody knows that's gonna be a challenge and we wanna talk about that some more, we can do that for a few minutes now or towards the end of the class. So just let me know if that's something we need to explore a little bit more based on your personal experience. And then the third thing is you need to be realistic is how much time and energy you wanna spend on the budget. There's a lot of electronic tools now that will help you uh, both on your phone or your laptop or your, or your desktop that will help you do the budgeting and do the dirty work and do the time consuming things that you had to do manually 10 years ago. So you can, if you set these up and use these electronic tools, you can actually do some budgeting relatively quickly. You can do it with spending, I would say for most of us, less than half an hour a month uh, doing it. So you can do it fairly easily from a time standpoint because the electronic uh, tools do most of the work for you. If you want to get a little more detailed, understand your budget a little bit more and get a little more, you know, fine tune your budget a little bit more, it might take an hour, an hour and a half um, to do that. So just be realistic with how much time you want to spend. And then we can figure out what tools will help us with that more. And we will talk about that as we go through this session. So those are the principles, the things we have to understand um, to create a real working budget that uh, will help us manage where we spend our money. And then the physical things you need, and we're gonna, this, we're gonna spend the next five or 10 minutes talking more about it, but the summary is we need to look at all of our income and we need to know where all our expenses are. And as we talked about a minute ago, we need to understand our money personality. Because if we don't understand that, we're not going to be able to put together a budget that's going to work. So we just covered a lot of areas there. Again, I'd like to open it up for questions by unmuting yourself or putting something in the chat. Any, any questions, comments, concerns? All right, well, please, like I said, please ask questions as we go. Um, so the first thing we need to know is, is know all of our income sources. So since Get Set Up is, is typically more for people in or near retirement, let's talk about some retirement income. So can somebody help me out? There's two or three classic things that retirees will have as income. Does somebody want to jump in there and help me talk about some of those income sources pensions social security social, social security. security yep retirement retirement benefits from your past employer yep so pension and social security you guys hit the the, the top two you're absolutely right regarding those um any other thoughts from somebody a trust I, your trust, I yep, I call that, um, if you don't mind, investment, sort of lumping it all together. Some people have a trust, some have a 401 uh, retirement plan, something like that. So, so just to make sure we cover it all, I like to sort of group that into an investment category, but exactly right, that would include money coming in from your trust. So for most of us, if you haven't gotten quite to the retirement age yet, usually you've been saving money, building up money towards retirement. 
And then typically most of us, once we go into retirement, we start taking money out from our investments, whether it's in a trust, a 401k, um, any other sources that we have, uh, we start taking some out. So there's some income there. Exactly. So those are the three classic examples that most people in the retirement arena have. There's a couple, there's two others that are sort of, again, putting in some broad categories that aren't quite as, uh, uh, as many people have, so to speak, but a few, few people may have um, some still might be working uh, a little bit, maybe some part-time work. You could be working full-time. Most of us don't really, when we consider that, you might be doing some part-time work, some gig work, making, a, you know, doing a few hours here and there per week. So you may have a little source of income coming in that way. And then the last one I call uh, passive income. And when I say passive, that's something that you're getting some income in, even though you're not doing too much. So, you know, a perfect example may be if you own some real estate and you have a, a manager of that, you still have some money coming in every month, your proceeds from a real estate investment, a house or an apartment complex. There's some other things like that. So there might be some passive income, as I call it. So those are the sources for your income. So you really wanna make sure you understand where all your income is coming from. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about expenses. So really to understand your expenses, um, you need to do one of a couple different ways to handle this. One way is to go ahead and use one of the budgeting tools we talk about at the end. And those budgeting tools, you sign up for them and you give them your credit card information or your checking account information or both. And they will go in there and they will pull out your, all your expenses over the last couple of months. And then you can categorize them into, uh, they will figure out most of them, but there'll be some they won't. You might have like a local uh, or regional grocery store it's like in Chicago, a big one is Jewel. Um, and the program might not recognize that Jewel is a grocery store. So you would code that to groceries. And then once you've done that two times or so, the tool will understand going forward that when you charge something or write a check for something at Jewel, that it's a grocery and it will learn your spending pattern. So almost everything that you spend, especially the stuff you spend over and over again, it will go, it will know exactly what category, whether it's entertainment, whether it's groceries, whether it's your mortgage, whether it's insurance, all those different things, it will figure out. So you can do this by signing up for one of these electronic products that will help you budget. If you're not comfortable doing that or wanna dig in a little bit more, you can, what I would suggest you do is either go back for one or two months or for the next one or two months, go and look at all your expenses and figure out the categories for them. Again, this is a little more labor intense, uh, but some people don't like to uh, work so much with the computer and wanna keep their stuff more private and that's the way you can do it. The big trick here, I just wanna be, um, make sure we're all on the same page. The big trick with this is just, if you are a person that takes cash out uh, weekly or monthly, you say you take out, $300 cash, you do have to, the computer can, or no program can figure out how you spend that cash. And if you just have $300 cash and you don't break it down to what you're actually spending it on, I'm just going to be honest with you, at the end of the day, you're, ne you're going to have a very difficult time being successful because you need to know where you're spending those $300. Um, June, if you don't mind me just jokingly picking on you if, if, if June spends gets that cash and she ends up you know buying cat food we saw she had a beautiful cat when she first started there she spends a lot of money on cat food out of that cash and doesn't allocate it to her pet expense it's not going to be realistic um, you know so if you're getting out cash you do need to keep track of where that cash is going um, and then enter that into your computer program or your spreadsheet, whatever it is you're doing to keep track of your expenses. And then the final thing with expenses, let's just say you, no matter which way you do what we've talked about, there's gonna be some things that I will call seasonal expenses, things that don't happen every month. 
but they're usually pretty big. And this is really what we need to work on. So the classic example of a seasonal expense may be your auto insurance or your homeowner's insurance. So let's just say you've kept track of your expenses for the last two months and you did not have to pay your auto insurance because you only pay it once every six months. Um, or you pay your own homeowner's insurance. It doesn't come out of your mortgage. You didn't pay it because it wasn't due. You have to figure out those expenses that don't occur every month and then figure those out into your budget. And the, the re reason I call them and others call them seasonal expenses, a lot of these expenses are things that only happen for a period of time. So June, if she has um, you know, somebody that mows her yard, that's gonna be year round since she lives in Florida. So that's not really a seasonal expense. Everybody's gonna be every month, but uh, uh, those of us that live in the Northeast or the Midwest, we may have somebody come for three or four months and, and plow our driveway um, from snow, et cetera. So we'll only have those expenses for a few months out of the year, but we need to figure out how we're gonna pay for those um, so we need to keep track of those. So those are, that's why the name seasonal expenses comes in. So we've home covered a lot of ground. Are, uh, home repairs are always a big shock, you know, when they, they come up and they, you weren't expecting it, but, uh, you know, the air conditioner goes bad or you need a new dishwasher, you need a new refrigerator, uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of those are the things that really uh, I'm not, you know, well prepared for. It's always a shock, right? Yep. And I talk about those. So let's talk about it now. I usually talk about it a little bit later on, but you know, that's perfect. And you're absolutely right. So what I propose is the, the two big places where those can occur on a regular or a semi-regular basis is just like June said, the home. And the other one could be your car. Right. You need new tires or you need new brakes on your car. If indeed you do have a car, um, you know, somebody that lives in New York City or Chicago, we may not have cars, but in other places we do. So those are the two big areas where you can go three, four, five months. You can go a year and a half without having any expenses. And then something big comes up, as June just talked about. So what I advocate is having what I call a maintenance allowance for those Either you can lump them together, knowing it for, it's either for your car or, and your house, or you can have two separate ones, one for your house, one for your car. And so what I advocate is you figure out an amount of money that you put in there every month, um, whether you have any expenses or not. And then when the expenses do come up, June, hopefully you've been accumulating, you've been budgeting for them, say, let's just say it's $200 a month. You've been budgeting $200 a month, and let's say in in six months, you need a new air conditioner. Now, you might not have fully enough in there right then because you just started budgeting, but you have a running start. You have some money in there, and then you continue to put some money away into those emergency funds for your house and your car. Um, and I do another session with Get Set Up called Intermediate, or it's called Budgeting Workshop, and it's really meant to be a follow-up class to this and we we spend a lot more time actually playing with a a real live budget and in there i go a lot more detail into a maintenance uh budget for the car and the auto but that's the way i would propose you do it does that help a little bit june yes it does thank you sure and then the other thing that sort of coincides with this is really to make a workable, easy to do budget, you need to make your expenses monthly. So what do I mean by that? So let's let's pick on a, a seasonal expense. Let's just say that your car insurance, you pay it twice a year, and I'm going to make these numbers real easy, but you pay it twice a year, it's $600 in June and $600 in December. Let's just make that up. So that means you're spending $1,200 a year on your auto insurance. If you try to budget for $600 in June and $600 in December and only those two months, it's not going to be successful. It's going to be a nightmare to try to work out and it's just going to drive you crazy and it's going to be confusing and I can promise you it's not going to work. So for all the items, if they are not regular routine expenses, what I suggest is you make those a monthly expense. So just using the car 
insurance as an example that we just talked about, $1,200 a year for that car insurance we pay twice a, twice a year. I would take the $1,200 and then divide it by 12 because there's 12 months in the year. And then that's saying on average, we're spending $100 a month on our auto insurance. And that's what we put into our budget. And each and every month, we put $100 of our expenses towards the auto insurance. And then when the auto insurance actually comes up, we have the money to pay for it. So what that means, and this is the trick, and again, this gets to your money personality, is there's going to be some months where you don't spend all your money that you have budgeted. So you might have coming in again, let's just say it's, it's well, let's say it's March because it is March. You're going to have in your budget, you're going to have $100 for your auto insurance, but you're not going to pay anything. Um, so that means your expenses are going to be less than your income for the month. Um, so if you have the, again, your money personality, if that doesn't bother you and your checking account gets a little bigger and it's not going to, it's not going to make you want to spend money because it's up a little bit higher than that's fine. You can keep it in your checking account. If you see extra money in your checking account, you know, that's your personality, you know, you're going to spend it. Then you need to take out any maintenance budget and any of these budgets that don't occur every month and go put it in your emergency fund so you don't see it there in your checking account and you don't have the urge to spend it. So all of this, that's why I said you need to understand your money personality. And then when it comes due, you can take the money right out of your emergency fund because you've been putting it in there every month and you have the full amount to pay. And it really doesn't affect your emergency fund because this was extra money you put in there knowing you were going to use it in June or December, at least from my example. So questions on that? Okay, the same thing happens on income. We, somebody talked about their investment income or their, their um, um, retirement income coming in from investments, and that might not be the same every month. So things like our social security benefits we know that's the same every month between January and December. Uh, if we do get a pension, that's probably for almost everybody. It's the same amount every month. Um, but then other things like our investments, we may get them at different times. We may, they may not come in constantly every month at the same amount. So you want to do the same thing, figure out approximately how much income you're going to bring in from your investments for the year, and then divide that number by 12. And then that's going to be your income on average for your investments. All right, what other questions do we have? Well, I get like a required minimum distribution. So, but I take it out once a year. So I suppose you should count that as income and divide it by 12 in your exactly. budget that that's your what you're doing. Yep, that's exactly right, June. So the, for those that were June's question, when she said require min, minimum distribution at, at a certain age, and that age just recently changed uh, from 70 to 72, you have to take some money out of your 401k or your IRA required by the government. And they give you a formula on how much needs to be taken out at minimum. You can take out more, but you have to take out at least that much because they want you to pay taxes on it is a real reason why. Um, so that's what June's talking about by a required minimum distribution. And you can take them out however you want. You can have it taken out all at once, like June's doing. You can have it taken out monthly. You can have them taken out once a quarter, whatever, but exactly right. If you do it, take out one big lump sum a year, you should divide that number by 12 and that's your average monthly income. If you have it taken out every three months, you divide that by three. And then for those three months, you get one third, one third, one third. So exactly right. All right, so that's the understanding, the general understanding of the budgeting, the budgeting basics, like I said, for this session. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we have another session that I do called Budgeting Workshop, and we go into a lot more detail. We use some examples of all the different categories you may have, 
and we play around with some budgets, uh, sort of almost in real live uh, action to uh, make things happen. So what I would propose if, uh, if you like this class and go ahead and start doing a budget, I would work with your budget for a month or two, maybe for a month, just try to figure it out, play with it for the first month, see where you are. And then um, I would think it might be then an, an, a nice uh, enhancement to go ahead and take that budgeting workshop class. And you'll have some good questions and we're gonna go into some more uh, gory details on how to how to play to make sure we have a budget that makes sense, makes sense to us, is realistic, and we can um, make it help us figure out where our money is going and and help figure out where we want to do it. And not to oversell it too, but I also have another session on called ideas for reducing expenses. So if you do um, feel that you need to reduce your overall income or you want to just shuffle some money from one category to another, the ideas for reducing expenses might be another uh, session that might be of interest and value to you. But back to this one now, the budgeting types to consider. We're going to go over four budgeting types. Again, for those of you who may join a little bit late, um, all the budgets, no matter which of these four we talk about, they all do the same thing at the end of the day. They they allocate your expenses in the different areas and then help you uh, see wh where you're spending your money so you can adjust your spending as you need. They just do it from a different angle, a different perspective. So the first one's called the 50, 30, 20 budget, and these are percentages. So the 50%, this is basically saying that approximately 50%, half of your income, you should budget towards your expenses that are basically your necessary expenses um, that you need really to, to live and survive. Um, your, your needs, not your wants, not what you want, but what you need. So we need to have shelter over our head. In today's world, we need to have insurance. Uh, we need to have groceries. There are certain things that we need to have or survive. So things like your mortgage or your rent, your insurance, your groceries, those go into your 50%. And approximately 50% of your overall income should go to those type of expenses. So the middle number, the 30%, that goes to our wants. So the first category is those things we need. The second category is our wants. Um, so these are things we don't need to have to survive day to day, but we want them. We've spent a lot of time working for most of us, requiring some money. We want to enjoy life for a while. Um, and even if you haven't retired yet, you still have some wants. So, you know, things like gifts for your grandchildren, going out to a restaurant. We all need to eat, but we also know that going to a restaurant is more expensive than buying groceries. So your groceries go into your 50% category your restaurant spending or your fund money, so to speak, goes into the 30% category. These are things that we want to have, but we don't need them to survive. So remember what this budget is doing, it's just helping us see if we're spending on average about where we should. Um, and then the last 20% in the true budget, if you look at this, what this budget is meant to say, this 20% is what you should uh, spend towards saving towards retirement. But again, in the get set up environment, most of us are already retired. So I look at that 20%. Um, if you do have any credit card debt or any debt other than a mortgage or a car payment, um, you should consider paying it off as quickly as you can. But regardless, you should maybe, maybe you can count that into your 20%. Um, since most of us now maybe have to pay taxes on a quarterly basis, you might put your taxes into this 20%. And then if you're doing a really good job of this and you don't, especially if you don't have any, any um, outstanding debt, you know, June, this might be an area where you can actually put your maintenance cost into this 20%, those things we talked about to start building up something for your car um, or your house when, when something does happen, that maintenance could fall into that 20% possibly. So this budget is really good for if you haven't budgeted before and you sort of want to see uh, what your money is going towards. This is sort of a guide, guide rails, guidepost saying that, you know, about 50% should go to this category, about 30% to this category and about 20% to the third category. So it really helps you. And I would propose that most of us, this might be the best uh, budget to consider.
Questions? Um, so that's the 50, 30, 20 budget. And these budgets can also, I, I talk about them as four different budgets. You can uh, put some of these budgets together. And I would say the second one is probably one that you wouldn't use by itself for your entire budget. But this would be one where, again, we talked about understanding your money personality and knowing what is uh, how you interact with money. So this would be one that if, if you know you have a category or two where you're sort of inclined to maybe spend more than you want to or you should or more that's in your budget and that's just sort of a, a um, an area that you understand is, is your challenging category. You know, it might be clothes, like for me, it's electronics. It might be something to do with your car, whatever, whatever it is, shoes, whatever. So the envelope system was for, that name came from the old days. And by the old days, I mean, quite some time ago when we paid for cash for everything or almost everything we paid for cash. Now we use credit cards, de debit cards, checking, accounts, all that to pay for a lot of our expenses. So in the old environment where you had cash, what the envelope system is, is you would write down your different categories. So let's just, you know, use a couple. We could have our clothing allowance um, or maybe our entertainment allowance. And then let's just say for argument's sake that I've budgeted $200 a month um, for my entertainment expense. I would put $200 into an envelope, literally $200 cash into an envelope. And if I'm going to go do something that falls into my, my entertainment category in this example, I take the money out and go buy something. And then if you run out of what I say, what I say, if you run out of money before you run out of month, i.e. it's the 22nd of the month and I am going to a concert and now that ends it eats up my $200, I know that realistically, that's the last thing I can do in that category for the month. So another eight days, I get another $200 and can start over. So that's why I say this one's a little bit uh, different. So I would suggest you maybe use it for one or two categories only if indeed you have some challenges with that. Now, the envelope system can very well work over into the electronic world. Um, so a good example is that some of the budgeting tools, they may have a big circle. Uh, let's say it's $200 in our example, and so it'll say $200 in the middle, and it's all green. If you then spend $50 um, that goes into the entertainment expense, the, the green is now three quarters of it. And then one quarter is red because I spent $50 of my $200. So the circle is now three quarters green, a quarter red. And it's going to tell me right in the middle of it that I got $150 left. So you can do it electronically too. But um, that's the envelope system, the old fashioned way and the more modern way to work the envelope system. Questions, comments, ideas? All right. So pay yourself first is probably not a budget you would use year in and year out. This is an example when you want to do something different. So um, let's say one of us decided that hopefully we're getting out of the pandemic um, environment and you decide you want to take your family uh, or part of your family, whatever you can afford, let's just say on a, on a vacation, you all want, everybody should, is going to meet in, I don't know, Hilton Head, South Carolina, or let's say Disney World might be a good place. And you're going to help, you, you want to help with the, the, the kids or the grandkids. And you're going to, you're going to say, hey, I'm going to buy everybody's airfare, or I'm going to pay for everybody's hotel, whatever it is that you're, you've decided you want to do. So this is not something you do every year. So let's just say for argument's sakes and for easy math that this is you figured out that to buy everybody's airfare, it's gonna cost you $12,000 or you're also gonna buy some hotels, whatever, and that's what it's gonna cost. So again, using that 12,000 to break it down to 12 months, that's $1,000 a month that you want to spend, that you need to prepare for, for this vacation you're gonna take um, that you've decided you wanna do. It's again, not something you normally do, 
So the pay yourself first basically means that the first thing you're going to do in your budget is put $1,000 into this vacation because that's what you know you want. And now you know that you're going to have to reduce some of your other expenses for the next year to help pay for this big trip that you want to take. So that's why it's called pay yourself first. Or you may also have heard of this as the reverse budget because you're reversing and something that you want to do you're putting first because you've made the decision. This is important for you and I want to do this. I know I'll have to spend less money other places, but this is what I want to do. Uh, so you might do that for a year uh, with something special or different. And then the zero, the zero base budget is probably what most of us think about is our regular budget. Um, when we think of budgeting before we get into a lot of detail like we've done in this class and it basically is zero based every dollar has a has a goal so is the year if your income is five thousand dollars a month your expenses need to total five thousand dollars a month no more than that um and that doesn't matter you don't put them into different categories to help you figure out maybe where your weaknesses are or you don't worry about paying yourself first you just put everything together so it doesn't matter if you want to spend two-thirds of your money on a big fancy car uh, that's fine as long as you understand you're not going to have very much money for everything else. But if that's if that's your primary goal, that's fine. So the zero based budget is basically um, a basic budget with no guardrails, no no help to you. You just do it the way you want. Questions? All right, so a few closing tips here in this category. You need to allocate some money to, to play money, right? You, you know, it, it may not be a lot if you have all your good categories, but you need to, uh, you know, whatever it is that you don't do very often, but just some small things. Uh, maybe you don't go to a lot of uh, movies, but every once in a while, you know, once every two or three months, you go to a movie or um, and maybe you don't go out to many concerts, but infrequently you do. So you need to have every month a little bit of money. I, I call it play money, where it's just for something fun, something unusual, something different you don't want, you don't normally do, but you want to be able to do it. Maybe it's, you know, you buy a lot of ice cream in the summertime or, you know, go out for hot chocolate in the winter, whatever it is, little things that you want to um, not have into a big category and just lump them together. I call it play money for me. Um, I've been budgeting for a long time. So I use basically everything that's that's fun for me. I have a fairly big play budget relative, but then it includes everything. Cause I, I, I've been doing this long enough that it includes when I go out to restaurants, if I go to the jazz shows, whatever it is I may do, I put all of that in the play money because I've been doing this for a long time. If you haven't been budgeting for a long time, I would probably put it in, um, try to get as many regular categories for things you do regularly. And then the play money should just be for things you do sort of infrequently and that number shouldn't be so big. And then as June talked about, you have to understand there will be some surprises. I promise you your first budget you do the first year, it's not gonna be perfect. Uh, there's gonna be some things you really didn't fully think about. Just understand it, work through it and get better at it. Now, somebody like me, I have no excuses. There shouldn't be any surprises, right? I've been doing this for a long time, so I should know where all my areas are, but I still may be surprised in the sense that, um, you know, I have a fairly new car, but, you know, maybe I need tires more quickly than I thought, or, you know, there'd be some times where my um, maintenance budget on my car might not be enough. There might be other years where there I hardly have any maintenance on it, and I've, I've put away some money, but there will be some surprises, but just try to come through them, think about where they are, Again, using June was a good example. She thought right away, what happens when my dishwasher goes? Um, so we have those type of things. So now we know how to work on that. We have a, a maintenance budget for our house. You might realize after a year or two that, that the number you've chosen is not realistic. It might be too high, it might be too low. You need to adjust it somewhat. Um, and that's the things that you will do. And as you do the budget year two, year three, you're gonna start fine tuning it. And you can say, hey, you know what? I'm spending way too much money in this category, you know, it might be clothing and I would rather spend that money in another category it might be for uh, entertainment using my example. So I'm going to, I'm going to purposely budget less for clothing 
and more for entertainment. Now you see what you're doing. And like I said, this is where the fun part comes. You get to decide how you can get more money into the things you like and enjoy, as we talked about at the very beginning of this, and spend less money in areas you don't enjoy. Why spend, spend money you don't need to in something that you don't really enjoy? It right? doesn't make any sense. If you have a gym membership and now after the pandemic, you decide you could work, you can exercise outside, uh, you don't need to go to the gym as much. Don't keep paying that gym membership. You can cancel that uh, thing. So let's, you know, look at what we can do differently to get more money to do what we enjoy. So other questions? All right. So let's just talk about some of the budgets. We talked about some tools. So um, Mint. It's a product called Mint. It's the most popular budgeting tool out there. The reason why it's so popular is number one, it's good. And number two, it's free on the internet. You don't have to pay a monthly charge to use it. If you have some adult children or adult grandchildren, more than likely they're using Mint. It's, the, it's by one, the highly most used one by uh, people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, now, when I say it's free on the internet, we all understand that nothing is free on the internet. Um, so what does happen with Mint, they don't send you extra emails, uh, but when you do sign into the program, at least my experience, they don't send you extra emails trying to advertise things to you. But when you do sign into the program, you might get a little reminder saying, hey, you might wanna check this insurance company out. They may be able to save you some money on your car insurance or maybe a bank um, you know, we'll say maybe you can get a better interest rate by using this bank. So you will get things like that from that standpoint. So that's where the free comes in. It's pretty easy to, at least from my experience, to um, not worry about those. They're, they're, not, they're not obnoxious uh, type of things. Um, so really the Mint budget will work, the Mint product will work with any of these budgets. I just have it down in the 50, 30, 20 because the topics you can customize them. So as an example, you could put down mortgage and then right next to the mortgage, you could type in 50%. So you know that goes into your 50% category because that's a, an expense that you need to live having roof over your head. So that falls into the a category of things that we need, not things that we want. So the envelope system, um, good one for that product's called Pocket Guard. And it's the one that has a little circle like we talked about before. Uh, so Pocket Guard does have a free version and then the more um, detailed versions with more categories does cost some money. I believe anywhere from about $3 to $12 a month. So, um, you know, just something you wanna be careful of. We're trying to budget we don't wanna spend extra money that we don't need to. But if that's the best product for you, explore the free version first, and then you can slowly add some more options to it. For pay yourself first, there's a product out there called Capital. So it's like capital, which is your money, but with a Q instead of a C. And it has some good options in there, such as uh, being rounding up to the next dollar, you know, some charity things and things like that. And I think that sort of falls into the pay yourself first category. And again, that most of that, I think they have a free version also, but most of it is gonna be some monthly expense. And then the last one that for that zero base budget, an option is YNAB, which is an acronym that stands for, stands for you need a budget. Um, the problem with this one is it does cost, there is no free version. And it does cost about, I think 80 to $90 a year if you uh, subscribe for a full year at a time. So. Again, Mint will work with any of these categories, any of these types, I believe. Um, so it's a free version. I would suggest maybe you start with that one if you really feel comfortable. So you can explore all these on the internet. There's many more out there. These just seem to be the best ones um, for these different types of categories that I've seen. You know, if you already have Quicken out there, Quicken has its own budget. Mint used to be part of Quicken. So it actually looks a lot like Quicken, or you can use your, if you are a spreadsheet person, you can use a, a spreadsheet to do all this. 
Um, the only problem with the spreadsheet, it doesn't automatically fill in your expenses from your different credit card categories. You would need to do everything manually. So, but if you want to do it manually, that's another option. So we started out the session by talking about you need to know your money personality. And so here's really where your money personality comes in. These different types of budgeting uh, angles really sort of feed into what may be your money personality. So if you want to, you clearly don't have to, but if you want to just put in the chat which one of these budgeting types you think you're going to use or want to use or want to explore first, you're welcome to do that just to see if we usually we get a a pretty wide variety of, of examples when, when we do that. So if you want to do that, that's fine, but you don't have to. Um, so I'll let you decide on that. So here's sort of an example of the envelope system. Like we talked about, you would actually put money into all your categories. And then this, this is an example of, of the, the little, little bit of a tease in regards, this is the budgeting workshop class that I talked about. And this looks like a lot of numbers, but these are the same things we would talk about this side first, and then these are some examples of the side. But anyway, like I said, we're going to do a realistic budget and uh, have some things in here. And you can see, June, I'm even thinking about you. I say, you know, you might want to have a pet pet budget in there. We thought about that, too. So just some, some good examples that we have. So just as a brief summary, um, work within your money personality. It's probably the fourth or fifth time you've heard me say that. So that's indeed it is important. If you aren't being honest with yourself, this is not gonna work. If you say, oh, I save money all the time, I don't have any problems. And you pretend that's what's happening when indeed it isn't, it's just not gonna work. You just gotta be honest with that. You can make it work with whatever your personality is. You just have to be honest with yourself. Um, and you do have to work within your income level, right? You can't be making $5,000 a month and then spending $8,000 a month. On any one month, you can do that, but you're not gonna be able to do that every month and, and be successful. And that's the other thing to remember about a budget. Let's just say that I have um, a grocery budget of, of uh, let's say $500 a month. Um, so that's what, $6,000 a year. In no one month are you ever gonna hit exactly at $500. It'd be highly unlikely you're ever gonna, your budget, at $500, you're gonna hit your exact expenses. But if your budget is realistic at $500 for groceries, one month you're gonna do 480, another month 490, another month 510, another month 520. At the end of the year, they should be very close to that $500 a month on average. So don't think that you have to hit that number exactly. That number is just to be where you're gonna be on an average. Any one month you're never gonna hit or highly unlikely you're gonna hit that number. For things like your mortgage, obviously you can hit that exactly because the same amount every month. Um, but for most of the categories, it's not going to be the same. You know, if you if you pay for your uh, that snow removal we talked about for four months out of the year, and you pay the exact same amount whether it snows or not, then yeah, you know exactly what that number is. If you got to pay by the number of times they come out, you have an approximation of that, and it's going to average out. At the end of the year, you're going to be pretty close to what your final number is need to be flexible and adaptable. Again, we need to adjust as we realize, especially early on that we've forgotten something or, hey, you know what? I'm really not spending that much in this category. I can shuffle some of that money over somewhere else. So again, I wanna get away from that thing of the budgeting is something bad. So if you have a, a well thought out realistic plan, um, you know you can handle both the good as well as the not so good time. So a bad month, you know that you've got a plan in place and another month's gonna be better. Uh, and you, if you have a working plan, it is easy to feel comfortable overall that we can handle it with our budget being the, uh, the guide to us. 